guys. So many of you were asking different forms of the same question on Snapchat, Twitter, and so on. Um, so essentially, people are saying that they're stuck at a low grade in English, despite uh, working really hard, learning quotes, and so on and so forth. And they're not really getting any criticism that they could use to improve and not really sure how to uh, get better and how to actually improve their grade. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of different things that are recurrent mistakes. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the need for a strong introduction, especially the opening sentence. It needs to captivate attention. It sets the tone. It's disproportionately important. Just like when you hear a new song from the first 10 or 15 seconds, you kind of have an idea of whether you like it or not. There is a chance that uh, you will end up liking it despite the beginning, but more often than not, it kind of really gives you a lot of preconceptions of what, what you're going to think about the rest of the song or the essay, as the case may be. So I'm just giving this example from Hamlet. Um, you don't need to know anything about Hamlet, but just reading these sentences, um, the first sentence is, the women of William Shakespeare's Hamlet appear to be frail, passive figures used as pawns and dying prematurely after the mistreatment of men. There's nothing wrong with the sentence, but I rewrote it here. The women of William Shakespeare's Hamlet appear to be frail, obedient, lackluster pawns callously manipulated by the central characters. To be completely honest, I nearly think that's a bit too wordy, uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that you need to add a little bit of drama, something to captivate the examiner's attention at the start. And I also broke it up into two sentences because I wanted to talk about the death as well, but death in Shakespearean tragedy is a sort of a thing in literature in, in and of itself. So I said, in keeping with the bard's vision of tragedy, these traits ultimately result in the women's deaths. And the bard is, is just another way of saying Shakespeare. Um, so you may or may not particularly like the style of this. I possibly, you know, get rid of one of the adjectives. Maybe all three is too much. But basically, you want to captivate uh, the attention of um, the reader from the start. And the reason I also broke it up into two sentences, that brings me to uh, my next point, which is generally it's good to err on the side of shorter sentences. So this is an example from a personal essay. So somebody wrote, I believe that if my father truly cared for me, he would be the one to make an effort. I'm still waiting. I think you all know just the cadence and the meaning and everything improves dramatically when you um, break it up. The other thing to note is that the punctuation is all wrong here. So when you're trying to write a complicated sentence like that, you really need to know exactly what you're doing or you'll just be wrong. So the next example I wanted to give was, uh, it's a short story and it's set in a kind of a Downton Abbey type era. Um, I waited for the carriage to take the bend out of the garden and so its clacking and grinding would not be heard behind me to turn the door of the Baudelaire Manor. Um, again, it's not wrong. We know what's going on. The syntax here is messed up in that the commas should be in different places. But it would be much better to uh, break the sentence up. Because the sentence is trying to be a little bit artsy, I didn't rewrite it because it would kind of lose uh, its intention. But what I'm trying to say is that if you're really trying to go for longer sentences, you just need to um, try really hard to, to get the syntax right. And we're going to talk about it here. This is a better attempt at a long sentence, but you can see here, so genre of play. Is of play really adding anything? I would argue it's not really. And here you see that there are two which clauses and there's an and in between. Must we really enclose this amount of complexity into one sentence? So I rewrote it. Uh, tragedy developed as a genre in ancient Greece. So the reason I changed it from uh, was developed to developed is because 
um, in terms of the content, it doesn't change anything. But usually, if you have a choice between a passive voice and an active voice, go with active. So was developed as passive and developed as, as active. Obviously, you can't always do that. But when you can, uh, go ahead and, and write an active voice. Just because it's clearer, it's easier for a person to um, understand what you're saying. So I then said it was influenced by the likes of Sophocles and Euripides, and I broke it up into three sentences rather than one, and it's uh, much easier to digest. So this is the first is a sentence which corresponds with Othello's murderous act to his wife Desdemona in Othello. Um, that was a standalone sentence from someone's essay. Um, you need to know that you can't have an essay that starts with which or that or because um, or when that doesn't have a main part. You, it's, a, it's a clause and it's a dependent clause. So you need the main clause in the same sentence. This can't be a standalone sentence. Uh, another example of a syntax problem is uh, Durkin's articulate and declamatory declamatory way of speaking informs the reader of many circumstances which transpired throughout his teenage uh, into adulthood years which constructed his perspective of life. There's a number of things wrong with that sentence. It's a bit too wordy, isn't it? And two which clauses and no commas. Um, even if you, you tried to be grammatically correct with the sentence, it's just too much. Uh, you should never have two um, dependent clauses like that, um, try and break it up, try and have shorter sentences. Really, trying to be complex usually just ends up in disaster, so steer away from it. And certainly, if you learn to be good at uh, being clear, when you do go for that complicated sentence, you're actually much more likely to do it right. The next thing I want to bring up is grammar. So. By and large, um, probably most of you know this, um, so a lot is two words, and it's I have done and I have seen. So you need to put in the have because it's a, um, it's called present perfect, it's the tense. And of course it's I saw and I did, if you want to go into past simple. So just make sure you uh, can use proper English as such. Your language has to be clear. So avoiding big words is a must. Um, in that opening slide, I mentioned a couple of words like lackluster. I, I don't necessarily think that that's a big word, but maybe some people feel that it is. Um, but you certainly want to avoid uh, consequences of erudite vernacular utilized irrespective of necessity. I, I picked that up from the internet, but really that's, um, th that's a scary reflection. On, and some people do write that way, and they, they feel that in order for their style to be elevated, they need to write that way. And what happens a lot of the time is not only does it just completely not fit the bill, but they actually get it wrong as well. So, for example, where somebody wanted to use the word impede, they ended up using the word implement. And where they wanted to say originate, they said uh, orientate, um, which just, you know, it, it makes you look so bad. So unless you know exactly what you're talking about, um, just don't go there. And when you have a choice between a simple word, a clear word, and a kind of elevated, complicated word, nine times out of ten, the clear and simple word is going to do a better job. That's not to say that you can't um, try and use the occasional uh, fancy word, but just be 100% clear that you know exactly what you're doing. The other thing is style. So this is kind of a little bit less important. It's just down to the feeling that your language creates. So I took this line from a personal essay. This particular person was talking about um, a very difficult emotional situation and they were describing how they were trying to navigate uh, the emotional wreckage that was created by um, difficult circumstances. And then they used the word accordingly. So if they had been talking about sailing, the word accordingly is exactly at home. 
But the difficulty is that they're talking about emotions, they're talking about drama, they're talking about sort of anguish. And the word accordingly just doesn't sit right with that. It's a word out of a manual, a legal agreement. It just creates a different mood. So this is probably a little bit more subjective and it's not uh, a huge deal, but also try and pay attention to this. Do your words um, sound like they're coming from um, a, a kind of a, a consistent emotional place? The same way you read The Economist versus uh, if you read a, uh, you know, a Snapchat story on Discovery, the language is going to be completely different. Um, and also the thing about language is that it has to be precise. Um, so here is an example that requires me to actually explain what's going on. Again, if you don't know about Hamlet, that's okay. Just bear with me. So Ophelia is w one of the kind of key characters, and she um, is a very obedient daughter. And this person describes how she is a perfect daughter. She's super obedient. And when her father asks her to uh, sort of get Hamlet into a situation where um, he can be spied on, she agrees. So um, the guy who wrote this says that she's a perfect daughter. So we can kind of see the point that if she prioritizes being a daughter over being um, Hamlet's girlfriend, then that does make her a perfect daughter. But then later he says Ophelia's perfection also becomes the reason for her downfall. Is she really perfect if she deceives Hamlet? So you kind of need to be consistent in, in terms of what you're saying logically. Uh, she's not perfect, is she? She's obedient. And maybe that's uh, the reason for her downfall. So that would be a better word. So it can be kind of tempting to use certain words rather than others. Maybe you stay consistent with what you said before. And this isn't really about um, language or essay writing. This is just about your logic. Uh, this applies to not just essays, it's, um, you, you would know this from kind of everyday life. So when you want to say something um, specific, just say that, don't say something similar to it, because here it just looks like a logical fallacy. Um, the other thing is staying relevant, and I talk about this a lot. Um, so the easiest way to do this is to keep looking back at the question and also reference the key terms from the question. So what do I mean by that? Um, so let's look at this T.S. Eliot question from 2016. There's a lot going on. So Eliot frequently creates memorable characters and dramatic settings to convey both his search for meaning in life and his sense of disillusionment. Now, the words Eliot frequently creates um, to convey both, that's not really key, right? That's the structure of the sentence. So Eliot writes poetry in a way that does something else, right? And what we really need to concentrate on is A, memorable characters, B, dramatic settings, C, his search for a meaning in life, and D, his sense of disillusionment. That is a particularly, particularly difficult question. There are four key terms as I see it. Um, most questions just have two. So how do you go about approaching it and being relevant? So when I say use the key terms, what I mean is do use them in the actual essay. That doesn't mean that you need to religiously mention them in every paragraph. You just need to mention them occasionally and certainly have them as a kind of a compass in your head in, when you're writing. So when you're planning out this essay, uh, you need to think about, well, memorable characters. Who can I think of who's memorable? Prufrock is memorable. He's not memorable because he's a superhero, but he's memorable because uh, Elliot goes into such detail in terms of what he is going through his head, how he doubts himself, and all those kind of things. We feel sorry for Prufrock. Um, so that makes Prufrock a memorable uh, character. A game of chess has a lot of memorable characters. The the kind of couple who are uh, sort of really neurotic and playing chess with each other, or uh, those uh, guys who were talking about falling out teeth and abortion uh, in a bar, uh, they are memorable. They're intense characters. Um, so just planning out this essay, kind of tag 
the poems that you're going to talk about. So in terms of dramatic settings, again, a game of chess, uh, Journey of the Magi, um, East Coker, those are all dramatic settings. Um, they're not necessarily the most intense settings. You can even say that Preludes has um, in, in a dramatic setting because um, it's not dramatic in the sense that it's intense, but it creates a lot of emotion. So you can feel free to interpret a word. Um, so search for the meaning in life. Um, certainly, um, Eliot is kind of an existential guy, and he especially searches for the meaning in life in East Coker and Journey of the Magi. You can also say that he looks for the meaning in life in sort of a post-war environment in a game of chess and similarly in um, the love song of G. Alfred Prufrock, uh, what has happened to these people, why are they like that, uh, what's it all for? Um, so you can kind of ask these questions. Certainly in Preludes he kind of questions the day-to-day -day and what, what is the meaning of it all. And all his poems are uh, very much um, permeated with a sense of disillusionment. Um, pretty much, yeah, every single poem. He does occasionally offer us a glimpse of hope, uh, but there is a huge amount of disillusionment. I'm sure you can find it w without me. But what I'm trying to say is you kind of take a, almost like a tag and you try and find... The, that tag mentioned in, in other poems. So that's kind of how I structure it in my head. Um, I just want to give another example. It's a simpler example. So Paul Durkin uh, takes a narrative approach to explore a variety of issues in poems of great emotional honesty. So um, the key terms I feel are a narrative approach and emotional honesty. Uh, exploring a variety of issues. So of course, every poet is going to explore issues in a certain way. Every single poetry question requires you to talk about the themes, the subject matter, the issues. You can call it whatever you want, but basically the what and also the how. So the how is imagery, structure, rhyme, whatever poetic techniques that they use. Um, it's all of those things about how s somebody writes. Uh, and most of all, how does it all come back to the themes? So what is it about the way that they write that emphasizes what they are writing about? That's kind of the key to any poetry question. So how would you illustrate the fact that Durkin has a narrative approach? Most of his poems are like stories. So a wife who smashed a television gets jail is literally a recount is a man recounting uh, what just happened. Um, six nuns is a story, and there are many stories within that story. Sport is a story. Father's Day is a story. Rosie Joyce is a story. Nessa is a story because it tells of how they met and so on. Um, even other poems like the girl with the keys, that's not so much a story in that it, it sort of begins in point A and ends in point B, but it talks about, you know, Pierce, it talks about emigration, so it creates a lot of references that we can make into a story. Um, similarly, uh, Parents and Ireland 2002, um, that kind of is full of, of the sort of things that um, create stories in different uh, s snapshots in, in time. And of course, Windfall is a story. Uh, you know, it starts off where he's uh, kind of a happy family man. In fact, he couldn't be happier. And it ends kind of really tragically. And that brings me to the emotional honesty poem. So if that doesn't make sense to you immediately, just try and rephrase it. So it's like talking to somebody who's really trusting you and really showing their vulnerabilities to you. So that is really how Durkin writes. So coming back to Windfall, like who else would write about how they were so proud and so delighted to be in a house of their own and have all these um, wonderful memories around them 
and, and all these meaningful small things like photographs and you know, books and whatever. And then he talks about how he was thrown out of his house and it's his fault. And he's wandering around Dublin looking into people's windows and sort of feeling sad for himself. Like that is really exposing uh, everything um, being really emotionally honest. Um, at the same time, uh, Six Nuns Die, that, that's a very emotionally honest poem. Um, most of his poems um, don't really hold back. Sport, again, especially given that it's an autobiographic poem, he really tells us so much about how he felt um, without um, really holding back at all. So again, you need to identify the what makes this question special. So if every poetry question is going to ask you about what a poet writes about and how he writes about it, the way these questions are different is through these key terms that really add a kind of a, a hue and a direction to your essay. So you just need to highlight them and keep coming back to those terms. The better you get at writing these essays, you won't need to use this crutch as much. It'll become kind of intuitive. But literally at the start, I think you should highlight it and keep looking back at it every five minutes. And if you find yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, if you find yourself going off on a tangent, just make sure that you come back and keep writing about the thing that the question is really asking you about. Because this tends to be the biggest criticism that you're not really answering the question. So to really answer the question, um, you just need to narrow it down to, to the really important terms in the question. I've mentioned this before as well, so quotation is super important for paper two, for single text and for poetry. Avoid writing a paragraph without at least uh, one or two quotes in it. Really every three or four lines have some kind of quote. It doesn't have to be super long. Um, a good essay might only have two or three long quotes in it. And by long, I mean like a sentence or like more than one line. Um, but you just need to keep sort of referencing back to the text. And this not only kind of keeps you honest and keeps you on track and talking about what's really relevant, but it is actually specifically asked in the question that you use uh, reference to um, the text or reference uh, to the poetry of a certain poet. And finally, if you're in the situation that uh, you don't know what to, what to do, how to improve, and you can't really figure out um, from what your teacher is, is telling you, I think it, it could be a good idea to just ask them again. The difficulty with it is that, um, so when somebody sends an essay to me, like to read through it properly and to give someone valuable feedback, it can take up to an hour to do that. So you can imagine the kind of pressure that the teachers are under. Um, also, for every one person who really wants to improve, there's going to be, I don't know how many, who will ask all these questions that require specific feedback and then won't do anything about it. Um, so the way I suggest is you ask them, what are the mistakes I'm making over and over again? Or you can ask them, if I were to work on just one thing to improve my essay, what would it be? And this really tells the teacher that you've thought about it, you've looked for your own mistakes, you can't find them, and you're looking for something very specific. Because if you come back to a teacher and say, well, how do I improve? It's kind of like, I don't know, going to a fitness instructor and, and saying, how do I lose weight? You know, tell me everything you know. It's very difficult for a teacher to... Um, answer that question. So you just need to be very specific. And lastly, um, all of this applies to different people in varying degrees. Uh, we're very happy to have a look at your essays. Um, do send them in. It's answer at 625points.com. Uh, reading essays is going to help you hugely. Um, when you read an essay on our website, um, it's going to have a lot of the stuff that just does nothing for you, but you might pick up, you know, one or two things that change the way that you kind of structure your sentences, that you write. You might pick up 
um, some nice phrase or turn of phrase or something like that. And bit by bit, you will build up into uh, good essay writing skills. So I think it's a huge amount of this is down to practice. So keep reading, more importantly, keep writing. And um, I look forward to answering more of your questions.